started in 2009 uh, with about 35 people who came that year. It was uh, one of my favorite uh, of our sessions, I think, because it was so intimate and everybody did something and, uh, you know, kind of traded around and introduced each other and talked and it, it, was, it was really nice. Uh, this year we have about three times that number in attendance and about 50 presenters. Uh, and some of you have been returning year after year, and we're really grateful for your continued support. So welcome. When I had a dream in winter of 2008 of inviting poets to Newport, I didn't think ahead. <laughs> and so I never conceived this would become an annual event. Uh, this has become the main place to be, and so I'm very happy to see you. Uh, just a few housekeeping matters before our keynote address. Uh, this year we'd like to ask you, just for security reasons, if you'll try to wear your name badge uh, to all of our events. This will offer you admission to the meeting rooms here, but also access to the breakfast buffets. And the uh, catering is coming from Georgie's Restaurant, just down the way. And they're very good. So uh, about 8 o'clock, right out in our lower lobby here, you'll find the breakfast and uh, they'll be pretty good. I'd like to also ask you uh, to make a note of whatever poems that you read, either in a session or at one of our open mics uh, tonight and tomorrow night, and send me a copy by email as soon as you get home, because this will go into what is what I'm calling our proceedings, which is um, our Concord volume, our Concord Anthology, and I've been doing this the last three years, and so if you were in last year, you can pick up a free copy upstairs, if you weren't in it, you can buy one, it's pretty inexpensive, and I can't remember how much it cost is, and um, uh, you, you can be in next year if, uh, for whatever you read or presented here, so please remember to send me something. Uh, this year, our open mics tonight and tomorrow night will be in the back of Georgie's. And they have a new sort of daylight basement room, which is right on the beach. It's really quite lovely. And uh, there will be a full bar there. And uh, it'll suit us very well, I think. So, <laughs> what you want to do is just to the right of the elevator is a door to a corridor that runs outside. And you can take that corridor all the way down to Georgie's and to turn right when the walkway ends. There's a little kind of a series of steps and a ramp, and it goes down around, and you'll see it down there. It's underneath Georgie's. Now, if you want to eat dinner there, unfortunately, they're not serving dinner down in that room. But you can call ahead and order a to-go dinner, and then you can pick it up and then bring it right down to our room or you can actually go in and order something to go and, and bring it on down. There are tables uh, as well as the bar down in that area. So if you want to eat at Georgie's, that's the way to do it. Well, I'd like to thank Writers on the Edge for being our parent nonprofit organization uh, and supporting uh, the Northwest Poets Convert. Also the Lane Literary Guild out of Eugene, which has been uh, very generous with their support each year. The Concord Board this year included Julius Jortner. Julius, could you just wave? Uh, Shirley Plummer. I'm not sure if Shirley's here yet. She had a broken bone and she's going to try to come. Shirley Plummer. Uh, Sue Fugalde Lick. Sue's there in the back. Ruth Harrison, uh, who may not be here yet. She's having some back trouble. And Dorothy Blackco Mack. Uh, Dorothy's on a writing cruise and couldn't, couldn't join us tonight. Right on the way. My sister, Linda Dorfler, is once again volunteering as our registrar, and Charlotte Denault has handled our bookkeeping, and Karen Wilson helped out with publicity. And I'd like to give special thanks to Stephen Blue, uh, who's uh, volunteered to do all the audio and video. Uh, for the entire concord. So thanks a lot to Stephen. Thanks, thanks all of you. I'm 
sad to report that during this past year we lost a good friend of the Concord, Virginia Corey Cozart, and she died on August 16th of 2012. Uh, Virginia was a watercolorist, a musician, and also a wonderful poet. Her book, A Mutable Place, came out in 2003. She tried to inspire others to seek and create beauty in the world. And I'd like to read one of her poems in her memory. It's called A Courtship. My parents' courtship letters, some marked save in mom's secretarial hand. Hard to find the right moment to untie the little bundle, dog-eared, faded, with postmarks November 1925 to March 1926. Should I, their only child, pry? I imagine the contents. Would I discover parents unlike the ones I saw exchanging quick pecks on the cheek? Separated by 40 miles of gravel roads, would they declare unbridled love, passionate longing, hints of an indiscretion? Feeling my heart constrict, I open the first one to Miss Alta Hansen of Prosper, Oregon. Dear Miss Alta, he begins, trails off with, may I hear from you soon? It is rather out of the way here, and all news is welcome. Your friend, J.Q. Corey. <coughs> Hers to him, addressed to Sixes, Oregon, starts, Dear Mr. J.Q. Apologizes for a fountain pen blot, ends with, Sincerely, Alta. By January, he has passed out engagement cigars. Girl of my heart, he calls her. With love, I adore thee. She teases, dear stick in the mud. Signs off with several oceans of love. Their ordinary love story, seen from beyond their 50 wedded years, telescopes to their star's beginning, its light just now reaching Earth. We'll miss you, Virginia. Well, now on to the fun part of this hour, which is our keynote address. Uh, I'd ask if you will remain in the hall after our talk tonight for the announcement of the winners of the uh, poetry contest. And then we'll move on to the open mic at Georgie's. So please just stay after the talk is over for a few minutes. I've long been an admirer of Ellen Waterston. Via Lactea, which will be released in fall of this year by Atelier, Atelier 6000, will be Ellen's third edition of poetry. This book-length collection is based on her walking the Camino de Santiago in April of last year. Her other titles include Cold Snap and Where the, Qu the Crooked River Rises, a collection of personal and nature essays located in central Oregon's high desert. She was the winner of the 2008 Northwest Perspectives Essay Contest, and her poetry awards include the 2009 and 2005 <coughs> Willa Award for her collections Between Desert Seasons and I Am Madagascar, respectively, and the 2007 Obsidian Prize in Poetry. Her memoir, Then There Was No Mountain, was rated one of the top 10 books by the Oregonian in 2003 and earned her an appearance on Good Morning America. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> she served on the faculty of Summer Fish Graph in 2012 and in 2013 judged the Northwest Perspectives Essay Contest. And I know her best from her 11 years as founder and director of The Nature of Words, a bent based literary arts nonprofit organization. She has recently passed uh, the baton on to focus on her own writing and on the Writing Ranch, which she founded in 2000. This offers workshops and retreats for emerging writers in Central Oregon, Europe, and Mexico. She's currently working on a novel and a second memoir. She joins us tonight from Bend, Oregon, and I'm very happy to have her here. Please help me help her. welcome Ellen Waterston. Well, it 
was a beautiful drive over from Bend, and it's a beautiful view from my room. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thank you, Sandra, for inviting me to, uh, to participate. I'm not sure where to put this. So, as, um, as Sandra mentioned in her introduction, following in the footsteps of thousands of pilgrims, penitents, and seekers over centuries, last spring I walked the sacred ground of Spain's Camino de Santiago in search of answers to what's next questions. Thank you. This quest was prompted, as again Sandra alluded to, my stepping down after 11 years as founder director of The Nature of Words a month spent walking alongside others with their separate set of petitions and my worldly needs contained in a small backpack seemed the right prescription for slate cleaning. It was never my intention to write about the experience, rather as I walked, to determine which of the writing projects I'd been hungering to begin I'd first tackle on return. But the list of life questions I was certain I'd resolved while walking the way was quickly supplanted by what the Camino had in mind, including, as it turns out, what I'd write next. When I got back to Oregon and was sorting through brochures and mementos of the trip, I stumbled on a map of the 10 Camino routes that converge in Santiago. What jumped out at me looking at that small map was the stick figure outline of a woman leaping. In that moment, Camino woman was born in my imagination, and she wouldn't let me go. She insisted on being written. Here's an excerpt from the poem introducing Camino woman. I am a leaping petroglyph, my she-shape she traced by the feet of centuries of praying pilgrims filing across the rocky face of Galicia. My limbs are sketched by the ten Caminos, my stick-figure legs straddle Spain, the thin train of my dress trails careless over the Pyrenees into France. One of my olive-groved arms plums Portugal, the barnacled other breakwaters the coast of Mar de Cantabrico. Tied in eucalyptus, my long graying braids, primitivo plata, dangle across each of my mossy cobblestone breasts. <coughs> So Camino woman is sort of a badass, and she uh, is a bit of a challenge to, um, to the, the personification of the Catholic Church. So fleshing out her fictional character as the embodiment of all holy women marginalized by patriarchal religions spawned other characters, other voices, including a fictionalized Pellegrina of a certain age with her issues, a stylized and profane Catholic Church in Father Tomas, an omniscient third-person voice, the role of the hospitalero as wisdom keeper, and caricatures of others met along the way. The Camino is sometimes referred to as the Via Lactea, a reference to the fact that the Milky Way is always overhead when walking. This observation inspired a legend among early-day pilgrims I describe in the collection's title poem, Via Lactea. It said, the Milky Way's but dust kicked up by pilgrims' feet, the wheel-shaped star city made by Pellegrinos walking, the shimmering arrow of Sagittarius points to the middle of the misty arch where sparkles and flares blend in giant curved arms of gleam and Camino powder and ash. The sun teeters on the edge of this spiral fanfare, fancying our distant world with ancient light, where luminous bands of the religious walk the trail of ghosts in clusters, chains, ribbons, each pilgrim part of the same spiral story, each pilgrim's prayer a pinprick in the bag of obsidian night, writing a new bright galactic starway illuminating the raven abyss. But now, the tongue of the galaxy grows thick with time and distance. 
less and less intelligible, depleted Jovian giants bellow across light years. They say, wake from your arrogance, your tumbling sleep, lest your El Nino oceans boil. Beware the outrush of expanding notions of self, the rapacious black hole of your greed. Even the present night is eclipsed by day. Via Lactea will be published by Atelier 6000 of Bend with a launch of November 1. First is an art book and subsequently followed by a commercial run. It's a model I'd be happy to talk to any of you about after my comments. I tell you all this because, well, I'm excited and, and uncertain as we always are when we're launching uh, something we've created that also feels risky but also because in reflecting on the process of writing Via Lactea, what was intriguing was the dance between form, both overarching and specific to individual poems, and function, hence today's topic, a poet's Camino, how form follows function, or if it does, we'll see. The first form that applies to this collection is that of the verse novel. Via Lactea as a narrative is told through the medium of poetry rather than prose, a kind of a libretto in search of music. This is no edgy postmodern genre, as you know. The heroic epics Gilgamesh, Aeneid set the stage starting in 10th century BC. Modern versions include Anne Carson's The Beauty of the Husband, The Sugar Mile by Glenn Maxwell, David Mason's Ludlow, Two of my favorites are Patricia Smith's Blood Dazzler and Frank X. Walker's Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York. What previous experience did I have with this form? None. The form found me, just as the stick figure rendering of Camino Woman found me, plunging in, as is my want, I quickly encountered the pitfalls that poet Michael Simmons Roberts describes to the to-be-avoided presence of essential but dull building blocks to get from A to B. <laughs> or the crafting of a story long on music, short on narrative. How could I provide the necessary narrative information without the work going flat? Had I subjected each line of poetry to formal pattern and or creative pressure so the writing didn't get soft in the middle? Working within this form turned out to be exciting and humbling. No sooner did the Camino woman show up as the muse and the verse novel present itself as the container then the poems and their forms lined up along the trajectory of the narrative like vertebrae along the spine of the story. In Via Lactea, I wrote in free verse, came up with some new forms, honored, reinterpreted, and insulted traditional ones. All in pursuit of what I hope is a healthily dysfunctional result. Maybe that's it. Form follows dysfunction. Former U.S. Poet Laureate Ted Kuser recalls a teacher who said, it is permissible to substitute a trochee or spondy or anapest or dactyl for an iam, but only in the first or third foot, never in the second or fourth. <laughs> <laughs> this form business, syllabic or accentual measure, blank verse, marching in time with iambic pentameter. Nevertheless, I was eager to try my luck. I learned to feel at home with the high bun in one definition described as terse prose, usually ending with a haiku. The hyphen is also often associated with travel writing, is sometimes described as a narrative epiphany. So it not only suited my style of poetry, but also this walk, one that included journaling every day, that is, after changing the bandages on my sore feet. The tanka, sometimes referred to as short song, best known in its 57577 five, seven, seven, syllable count form, its meter and shape on the page mimicked the robotic action day after day of walk, eat, sleep, then walk some more, and mimicked the isolation I sometimes felt on the trail. For Patricia Smith, in Blood Dazzler, her powerful verse novel about Hurricane Katrina, the tanka fit the telling of drowned victims. The breath just before, the last breath harbors the soul encased in a verb. I know the word by heart now, Oh, I wish I could tell you. Here is what drowning feels like. God's hand smothering your heart. And the thumps grow slower, slower, 
until he takes back your name, lifts you. Another form was the guzzle. Guzzle. Castle. You know. <laughs> Built of couplets and repetitions. And its form mirrored for me the constant rain day after day while on the Camino. But my free verse, but for me free verse is my style. My righty and my goofy to steal from snowboarding lingo. <laughs> Righty and goofy, right? depending on which foot you have in front. Forms for me are hard, the way a New York Times crossword puzzle is hard. Robert Haas describes forms of poetry as numbers falling through numbers. For the form phobic, they can be numbers disappearing into a black hole in space. Unless, of course, you're David Hedges. <laughs> who humorously mourns the disappearance of poems written in traditional forms in his A Guide to the Modern Sonnet, appearing in the most current issue of Verse Weavers. Erase old-fashioned notions from your mind. Frivolities like rhyme, unless it's slant, and meter, because meter is a grind, a kiss of death when going for a grant. Now let your nimble fingers wade at will, in pools of unadulterated thought. Express your inmost contradictions, spill your beans, but stick to business. Thou shalt not, on penalty of death, write 14 lines. It's over, baby. Modern won the war. Gone are the brick walls with the ivy vines. New waves knock against the rocky shore. Couplets, once considered groups of two, may stretch from none at all to quite a few. <laughs> Despite the challenges, writing according to the strict dictates of a form forces word juxtapositions and rhythms that we might not otherwise be introduced to. And we can carry those conquered discoveries back to our caves. It's considered good for you to study the mechanics of form, know about rhyme and meter, just as steel cut oats are good for you, or <laughs> interval workouts, or liver. But seriously, we all know the more tools in the toolbox, the better. So when a form comes calling, you can recognize and greet the unexpected guest. The best of poets exemplify and advocate that the form of a poem must disappear, should not bring the reader back to the surface of the poem, not announce itself, overwhelm the content. Quote, every good sonnet is a good poem first, a good sonnet second, says Kuser. Poetry must lead and the form follow. Here's a fine example by Mark Doty, titled Golden Retrievals. <laughs> Fetch, balls and sticks capture my attention seconds at a time. Catch? I don't think so. Bunny, tumbling leaf, a squirrel who's, oh, joy, actually scared. Sniff the wind, then I'm off again, muck, pond, ditch, residue of any thrillingly dead thing. And you, either you're sunk in the past, half our walk, thinking of what you can never bring back, or else you're off in some fog concerning tomorrow, is that what you call it? <laughs> My work to unsnare time's warp and woof. <laughs> Retrieving my haze-headed friend, you. This shining bark, a Zen master's bronzy gong, calls you here entirely, now. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. <laughs> Definitely the sonnetness of it vanishes. <laughs> But what is the genesis of form, including, by the way, the very important and often overlooked consideration of the actual physical appearance, shape of the, of the poem on the page, the sort of the feng shui of the poem? A brief book reveals, I believe, something of the core function of poetry. 
Coleman Barks says form is made of sound, the taste of words, the taste of language, delicious to the mouth. At its core, maybe form is nothing more than a reflection of the rhythmic signature within each of us. We, as poets, are tapping time to our own rhythm and also to the collective subconscious rhythm. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Rivers and drums, according to Kim Stafford, short beats and long and uninterrupted ones. The study of other forms and other poets introduces us to other drum beats, other river sounds we can incorporate into our own work. Robert Haas, in discussing a little book on form, talks about bilateral symmetry, beauty and function. The poet seeks what Haas calls right ratio in writing and in life, of safety and freedom, of connected and not, recurrence and rhythm versus chaos, being and becoming. Haas asks, what is the question of the poem and its answer to itself? And I ask, what is the question our lives ask and our answer to ourselves? A poem our lives can turn or stand still, a poem turns on its own question. Verse means turn, a phrase meaning change in rhythm and form. New forms emerge in the rhythmic patterns, the repeated going away from some established sound or shape or rhythm, and then the returning to the original pattern, like a child chasing and then retreating from waves on the beach. A poem with working within form, then breaking out of it, is like the stages of child development from safe and dependent to individuation. This is part of Haas's meditation. That's the poem's job, or one of them. The poem's function. It is at this point, it seems to me, that form and function merge. The question we form with our lives is the function of our lives. Poems try and try for right relationship, form to keep us and the reader of our poems awake and alive in the world. That's function. We try and try to make our sense of ourselves and the world, meeting ourselves coming and going in the process of writing poetry. As Doty says, if I don't give shape to my experience in language, I don't feel real to myself. So in the end, perhaps, the function of poetry is to give form to the poet and by association to the reader and to make velveteen rabbits of us all. Here is a poem by Bob Hickok. I don't know how many of you, I just discovered him at AWP this year. Uh, and I just, I, I just can't even decide which poem to read of his, but. <clears throat> um, I, I, I just think, I think that he achieves this, this, uh, the velveteen rabbiting. Pilgrimage. My heart is cold, it should wear a mitten. My heart is whatever temperature a heart is in a man who doesn't believe in heaven. I found half an old Barbie in a field and bathed her torso in a coffee can of rain, put a deer skull with antlers in a window to watch with empty sockets deer go by. These are souls given the best care I can manage. A pigeon died and I gave it to the river. If lightning loved me, it would be sown with tongues. It would open my mind to the sky within the sky. I put birds in most poems and rivers, put rivers in most birds and thinking, put the dead in many sentences, blinking quietly, put missing into bed with having, put wolves in my mouth hunting whispers, put faith in making each poem a breath nailed to nothing. I, I just, I think he's It was architect Louis Sullivan, the designer of tall steel skyscrapers in Chicago in the 19th century, who coined the phrase, form follows function, which came into my head months and months ago when Sandra said, what in the hell are you gonna talk about? The form determined by the purpose of and the audience for the building. And the notion intrigued me. Does this apply to poetry? At the time, <coughs> Louis Sullivan's was a radical concept, eschewing the old styles of architecture. 
Every established form holds within it the exhilarating invitation to push the limits so long as the integrity, the structure, the true north of the work remains intact. In poetry and in architecture, Louis Sullivan traced the origin of his idea, I bet. This has led me to think that form in poetry follows ignition, <coughs> follows combustion, and that function plays a role once heat is being generated. And I'm talking poetry heat. Nothing like it. There's nothing in the world like that heat that poems can generate. Camino Woman lit my fire. The actual path of the Camino de Santiago suggested a linked but staggered telling. Soon, unique forms <coughs> emerged. We all of us begin with a thought and an observation, with word kindling, consonant and assonant strips of paper, and suddenly the writing catches fire, and our function then, it seems to me, is to serve the poem. We all know the feeling of looking at a completed poem on the page and wondering where in the world it came from intimately familiar to us and a total stranger at the same time. Known each other forever and only just met. I feel that way about the gathering of poems in Via Lactea. And I have all of you to thank, as I prepared these comments, for a reason to reflect on their conception and birthing, as well as broader considerations of form and function. I close with the final poem in Via Lactea, a sort of a benediction, a thank you. Uh, the title of the poem is Return to Sender. Pretend you're an envelope with a note inside, written in the form of a prayer. Pretend the all of you, your m-dash laugh, your run-on mistakes, is the inscription of a perfect petition written by the poet in his, her, elegant, metaphysical hand, then folded, placed inside the envelope that is you, and gently mailed into the world when you were born. Your prayer is written within the within of you. The space between each you word is where he heaven abides. Asking help from a distant deity is a waste of time. Prayer is a reporting, a telling, Every day, if you can, turn more and more inside out so the you prayer is exposed to more and more light. Thank you. Atelier 6000. Um, it is a printmaking uh, collaborative in Bend, Oregon, and uh, they are getting more and more involved with book arts. Hence, Via Lactea will come out first as um, an art book um, with hand uh, lettered um, and pressed prints. Obviously, that's not my language. Um, and then it followed by a commercial run. So keep your eye on Atelier 6000, all you poets. Uh, it's a very exciting model, I think. Uh, both for them to generate some revenue for their nonprofit and also as a venue for, um, for poetry. If there are any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. I have information upstairs on the table um, about the Writing Ranch uh, and about Via Lactea. Um, May we have a copy of your speech? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was just thinking of asking her if I could publish it in the next year's conference. Maybe you can think about that. I'd like to have it if you. Sure. Thank you. I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long did it take you to walk the road? I was, um, it took, well, I did, I, I, one of the issues that I deal with in Via Lactea, which is, you know, are we enough, or where do we begin, or all of that, I started halfway, and it uh, was walking close to a month. Um, but if you start where, uh, you know, in, in, on the French side, and go up over the Pyrenees, and do the whole long thing, which is what the way, 
that film you were describing um, illustrates, uh, you're, you're easily walking for six weeks. And uh, you, you can't imagine what it is to the body to walk all day long. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, it, it wears you down. It really, it's surprising. I, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, young people who were thinking that it was going to be no problem were absolutely crippled at about a week. And you didn't even mention the rain and the snow. No, yes, we had lots of rain, lots of snow, but yes, that's all, all of this part of the surprise of the book itself. It's all, all contained in there. Yeah, it's a real romp, this funny little book. It is, this argument between the Camino woman and Father Tomas is, is pretty entertaining, not to mention this rather self-absorbed Pellegrina, so. <laughs> right. So are there illustrations in the book also? So in the art book, yes, there will be, there will be original um, uh, illustrations. It, the typography is being done um, by Sandy Tilcock. Some of you may know of her wonderful work in Eugene, and um, also Thomas Osborne of Ben, both of them working with uh, beautiful uh, graphic sense and um, wonderful knowledge of, of typography and layout. Uh, and then um, Ron Schultz is the printmaker. And in the commercial run, what we're hoping is that we can scan, that we can scan the artwork and include it in the commercial run, but it won't be, you know, it won't be the, the, the original work. Yes? Well, thank you again for your talk. It was really, really very interesting. And I appreciated all the different poets and poems that you brought into the discussion. And I know I'm going to want to reread Pilgrimage. Who was the author? I didn't quite catch it. Oh, Bob Hickok. Thank you. Bob Hickok. This is his book, um, Elegy Ode. And it's just, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really, I, it's, I, I, for me, I think there's a lot of, of, of poetry now that uh, feels as though it sort of intentionally creates these collisions of image, and then it sort of hangs just on the collision. He, he's doing that, only, only they're really stitched. It, ju it just feels stitched. So I, I just appreciate it. I really appreciate his, his writing. Yeah. How do you... How do you feel this is different than um, some of your other work for you, this experience? Well, I think um, sort of surrendering to the to the notion of telling a story and then these characters really doing what they do in prose, where they just, you know, they have a personality and there's stuff they want to do and accomplish and say. That was quite, quite different for me um, in, in writing poetry. And it, it was just kind of a delight, and it's it's a it's a total experiment. As I say, I have no experience with this with this form of a sort of a verse novel, or and that's all that is now being sort of loosely used too as a, as a full term. So I think that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that was a very different experience. I mean, I think in smaller, shorter poems, all of you share with that, that experience of a, a character emergence, but to, to, to develop it and have them talk to each other, bless you. So. That was the very first word that I felt coming through you. Does the word of you surrender, it feels like you're describing a surrender to something. Well, no, when I saw a Camino woman leaping, yeah. I was just like, anyway, I know we want to hear who the winners are of the, of the contest. Thanks so much for your time.
Oh, I don't know the names. You have to people. say about it, and then I'll say the first okay. name. <laughs> the third place poem is Other Woman Monologue. And that's Joan Dobby. Yay! <laughs> My remarks about it were that Other Woman Monologue vividly portrays a woman's anguish and confusion in loving a married man. I'm guessing the quoted questions are products of the speaker's own mind and internal dialogue. The last two lines, however, are the lines that surprised and thrilled me. I think that I would die for this. I know that I would kill. <laughs> Do you want to come up and read it, Joe? I have a copy. I didn't know if you were here yet. Just. I, I tend to recite my poems to myself all the time, and this is one I have, so I may not have to quite read it, but I will in your honor. Other Woman Monologue. I'm cast to be the queen of darkness, bride of evil, the wicked other woman in the play. Not her sweet, charming beauty in the center of the story, but the other, shadow woman, the one who waits alone in her lonely, echoing house, the one he comes to now and then, in the night, in secret, Whispering, it's only me, don't be afraid. And then, she must have known, for God's sake, please, it would destroy me. And what of hell, you say? I've been there. And it wasn't wickedness that got me in, but fear. And what a friendship between women. Isis, hear me out. I'm going blind. And what of love? I speak of hunger and of music, the song my body sings when his nipples brush my breath, his lips, his breath, the ancient warbler's holy trill. I think that I would die for this. I know that I would kill. surrounds us like the breath of large animals. Eyes and thoughts shut down, we fly with unconscious abandon. Your archaic smile just after sex is always the same. Ancient wisdom shines in your eyes and hair like a winter moon as the pair of us glide to earth on synchronous wings. 
Rain returns like a revenant visitor peering in windows. It rains gently on the town, Rambo said in a previous life. Time transforms everything, but in our hands, time comes to a standstill like the chime of a clock at one. Mist hovers in the evergreens, then drifts away on autumn winds. Against the damp chill, we light a fire under a fir log. We read and talk and savor autumnal peace, karma complete. We have found what it means to live on Earth. And the first place poem is Mud Flat Allure. Tim Winsell, is Tim here? Not here yet? Well, would you like to read it? Sure. Mudflat allure, birds in the moist darkness, a quintet of gulls, sharks for finger-length saltworms, evening snacks as the tide pulls away, our lanterns sizzle, flaring the abruption of a blue heron making his great jointed ascent, working at winter break. Wool union suits scratch young skin at the margins. Our burlap bags will not freeze while we kneel beside dikes to rake for manila clams. In deeper water, light gleams. A small tugboat nags at the vast corduroy of a log boom. Fog hangs in rivers of night air. I just love that vast corduroy of a log boom. <laughs> wow, what an image. Thank you so much, Tim. <laughs> so if you see Tim, make sure you have him uh, talk to me because I've got a little award for him. So. Oh, okay, if he doesn't show up, I'll give him. Okay, so thanks so much. We'll head on down the, the corridor there and we'll see you at Dorothy's in a few minutes.